Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Pardon the interruption. Um, I'll just, if I could get your attention, one brief moment. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the chief executive here. Sorry to interrupt you. I hate to interrupt great conversation, which I know is happening all over the room right now. Um, it is wonderful to see all of you here. Um, I see uh, there's a lot of people I haven't seen in two years, and it's really nice to see you. If this is your first time back at the City Club uh, since, um, since the dawn of COVID, welcome back. If you've been here a couple of times, um, if you've been yeah, welcome back, welcome back. Um, if you've been here a couple of times since we started doing in-person forums, thank you for continuing to come. Thank you for masking up and helping to keep your community safe. Um, there's a... These are crazy times. These are admittedly crazy times, and um, but all of you are doing such a good job helping to keep the community safe and strong and healthy, and we really appreciate it. Um, the, this isn't the official introduction to the program, but this is really just an informal welcome, a chance for me to say thank you to all of you for joining us and to, to take care of a, a little bit of housekeeping and, um, and offer a few other notes of gratitude as well. In terms of housekeeping, I mentioned the masking. Please, when you're done eating, please put your mask back on. Um, it just is the, the smallest little simplest thing we can do to help keep one another safe, even as cases have been mercifully dropping dramatically, and we are very grateful for that as well. Um, I also wanted to, wanted to note that in the, um, with the, the Q&A portion of the program, in the second half of the program, I know this is kind of a hometown crowd for Beijing Shaw, a lot of, a lot of Beijing fans here, Beijing stands. Um, and, um, but don't be afraid to ask the tough question. When we get to, um, come on, this city club, the city club, I know Downing's thinking about it. Um, <laughs> When we get to the Q&A, it's a little different than pre-COVID. We'll have two microphones at, at stands, both one over here and one over there. And when, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll let you know when it's your turn to come up to the microphone. Um, in between, each person will be sanitizing the microphones. That way, we don't use the microphone doesn't become like a disease vector or something like that. <laughs> Ellen Bogan, is that the right thing to do? Ellen Bogan's got my back on that. Dr. Ellen Bogan. Previous, previous City Club speakers, some, a lot of previous City Club speakers and some City Club board in the room too. Very nice to see. Um, so that's the Q&A. If you don't want to stand up and ask a question yourself, but you do have a question, there are two options. You can tweet that question at the City Club and our team will work it into the program. Or you can text it and there's a, a number that um, if you've done this before, you know the number, if you've heard it on the radio, it's 330-541-5794. I know you didn't catch that. Um, that's why if you scan the QR code on your table, you'll be able to um, pull up the digital program for today's, pro for today's forum, and then all the information is in there as well. Other information that you will find in there includes our sponsors for today's forum. Today's uh, one of our local hero series, which is sponsored by Citizens Bank and by Dominion. Please join me in thanking them for their support of the City Club. <laughs> Um, uh, a couple of other quick, uh, quick items, too. I want to thank our community partners for today's forum. The, uh, our community partners today include Global Cleveland and the Greater Cleveland Partnership. They helped to spread the word so we could have a, such a nice turnout today. Please join me in thanking them as well. Um, and a quick word about kind of more globally what we are doing here today. This whole thing, getting together for a conversation, to hear from a community leader who wants to share a new and sharpened vision for the organization that he leads, which could potentially have an impact on all of us and all of our communities across Northeast Ohio. This is work the City Club has been doing, and people just like you have been doing as part of the City Club since 1912. 
110 years of convening conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. And we are so grateful to all of you for being a part of that. This is, um, this is one of the things that uh, a, a free society looks like, right? That people can get together to hear provocative ideas and to, and to, come and to really like share with one another in sort of a, a sort of civic fellowship. And so I just want to thank you for being a part of that and mention that if you're not, I know a number of you are members of the City Club and we are so grateful for your support. And if you're not yet a member of the City Club and you're interested in membership, you can find out more on our website or um, from one of our colleagues at the door on your way out. Um, it is, we are powered by all of you and we're so deeply appreciative for your involvement in that way. Um, a couple of other things, we have a new addition to the calendar that's going to go up hopefully later today. Chris Kuhar, the executive director of the, um, the Cleveland Zoo, is going to be speaking um, about what he learns from gorillas, more or less. Um, there, there's a baby gorilla that was born. Can I share a quick story really, that I learned yesterday? So back in October, a baby gorilla was born, the first, Debbie Barry, correct me if I'm wrong, right? The first in the, in the zoo's 139-year history. And uh, a baby gorilla, and like it, it was troubled. It was premature, and its mother, did not actually want to have much to do with it. So another female gorilla took the baby on, right? And began to care for the baby. Um, she'd had her own uh, experiences having, having had four babies herself. This, ba this mother is 47 years old, um, pretty old for, to take on a, a newborn, and um, started lactating. Like, she was far beyond that stage of her life, and she started lactating. And it's just like there's this incredible story there about, um, about I, I don't know, the power of what's happening at the zoo and the power of, of simple, you know, of the love that families have for one another and, like, and all of that. Chris is going to do a much better job talking about the re that story. <laughs> I still can't get it out of my head. You guys all stopped on the word lactating. <laughs> And you're like, God, and Chris Nance is over there. He's like, he's going to mention ice shanties next. <laughs> anyway, okay, enough comedy. Um, <laughs> if you're not sure what I'm talking about with the ice shanties, just Google it. Um, okay, so um, Beju uh, and his team at the GCP worked really hard on, a, um, on this great video that kind of sets the stage for what Beju is going to be talking about today. And prior to the forum, we wanted to share it with all of you so that, um, so that we could have that experience. And um, so if we're ready for that, look at my colleagues, and I believe we're ready for that. So we're going we're gonna to do that, and then in about five minutes, we'll get started. Thank you very much. How do we become a great region on this great lake? It will take big things. An ambitious plan to develop in our lakefront. A Fortune 200 company born here more than 150 years ago. Enhancing Public Square. Reinventing our riverfront. To make it more welcoming and useful. Revitalizing our baseball stadium. And its surrounding neighborhood. Strengthening our innovation institutions and business corridors. Supporting our diverse communities and neighborhoods. Enhancing our parks and trails. And arts and culture community. But these big projects alone won't define our future. It will take seemingly small things with big impact. Investing in the training and education needed to create pathways for our kids to meaningful careers. It will take people like you, individuals with dreams who put those dreams into action. Building new businesses, new opportunities, new ways of thinking. It will be a shared commitment to improving our community and investing in our future generations. We've done this before. We can do it again. All of us working together. All for prosperity. All for growth. All for all of us. That's the way we reach our potential. A great region on our Great Lake. We're, We're all in. in. Are you? Join us at greatercle.com.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Friday, February 11th, and I'm Kristen Baird Adams, President of the City Club Board of Directors and Chief of Staff of PNC's National Regional Presidents Organization. Today's forum is part of our Local Heroes series, which spotlights champions here in Northeast Ohio whose hard work changes the way we view ourselves and the community. So it's certainly fitting that we welcome Greater Cleveland Partnership President and CEO, Beiju Shaw, who is leading the organization's charge to regain Greater Cleveland's standing as a great region in the Great Lakes. Greater Cleveland Partnership, of course, is the region's leading economic development organization and the largest metropolitan chamber of commerce in the nation with more than 12,000 members. In his first year at the helm of GCP, Mr. Shaw's leadership comes at a pivotal time, one in which we are undergoing an extraordinary period of transition and opportunity, while continuing to face long-standing economic challenges, including persistent poverty, inequities, and unequal access to economic opportunity. As detailed in its recently unveiled all-in strategic plan, Greater Cleveland Partnership has embarked on an ambitious effort to accelerate growth and prosperity with the vision of a thriving region for all businesses and individuals. All In focuses on collaboration with private, civic, and public partners who together are harnessing the opportunity to grow a region built on dynamic businesses, innovation, abundant talent, and inclusive opportunities. We've invited Mr. Shaw here today to share with us additional details on this important effort, the partnership and collaboration that are critical to its success and progress to date. Mr. Shaw, appointed to his current role in the spring of 2021, is just the second person to lead the, lead the Greater Cleveland Partnership since its founding in 2004. Prior to leading the Greater Cleveland Partnership, Mr. Shaw served as the Senior Fellow for Innovation at the Cleveland Foundation and as President and CEO of Biomotive and co-leader of the Harrington Project for Development and Discovery. He also served as the co-founder and CEO of BioEnterprise. He has a JD from Harvard and a BA from Yale and serves on a number of for-profit and non-profit boards locally and nationally. As in every City Club forum, you can participate with your questions. Text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them to at City Club, at, at the City Club, and we'll try to work them into the program. Members, guests, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Greater Cleveland Partnership President and CEO, Beiju Shaw. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for that kind introduction. The one part that she left out is that I am a Clevelander by birth and a Clevelander forever. It's an honor to be invited to speak at the City Club, and it's an honor to be here in front of so many friends, team members, board members, and partners, and I want to thank you for being here in the room today. And of course, to my wife, Koyan, who has always supported me being all in and Cleveland all of the time. This afternoon, my aim is to share with you an inspired vision for the region, and more importantly, to share with you how with the right mindset, spirit, and values, we are working in unity to bring that vision to full fruition. Now, if you were inspired by that opening video, the vision of Cleveland becoming once again one of the great regions in the Great Lakes, all in is where it starts. All in is what it will take, and all in is what the civic system is already doing to get us there. 
All in, two words, five letters. It's a simple idea with the potential to absolutely transform our region. We're going to cover a lot of ground here today. So if you don't remember anything else from these sets of remarks, other than Dan's comments about the baby gorilla, <laughs> just remember all in, those two simple words. Now, as Kristen said, nine months ago, I had the privilege of becoming the president and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. We are the region's chamber of commerce, and as she noted, the largest metropolitan chamber of commerce in the country. Our mission is to accelerate growth and prosperity in the region. And the strength of our organization is the leadership of our board and our members, which enables us to serve as a catalyst, a convener, and a connector among private, nonprofit, and public organizations, all engaging directly, all working, and as our organization's name says, in partnerships towards an even greater Cleveland. From the outset, we established three primary objectives, three objectives that continue to be our focus today. First and foremost, to restore the civic system, the foundation in which private, public, and nonprofit partnerships can really power our community. Second, with our board, our team, and our partners to refresh the vision and the plans for a greater Cleveland. And third, to renew our focus and ec on execution and outcomes with milestones and targets. On the first, restoring the civic system, all in is where it starts. When we are at our best as a community, whether it's navigating this pandemic, creating opportunities, hosting global events, and even winning championships, we are at our best because we are all in. Those words describe our mindset and our spirit in those great moments, where each individual and each organization is contributing towards a common aspiration that transcends and transforms our community. We have chosen all in to summarize the mindset, spirit, and values that this, we and the civic system must have to power us towards an even greater Cleveland. And to define that spirit, working with partners such as the Cleveland Foundation, Jumpstart, Team NEO, the Fund for Economic Future, and many others, we developed a set of all-in values to guide our approach. Seven values, all starting with the word in. It begins with being inspired, setting ambitious goals supported by a dedication to execution, being innovative, thinking creatively, embracing risk, and adapting to change. Inclusive, involved and interconnected, working with integrity, and always working in unity for our community. Not caring about who leads, who supports, and most importantly, not caring about who gets credit. Always in unity for community impact and outcomes. Now in communities, just like in organizations, culture is critical and foundational for success. And to achieve our mission and our vision, we need all of us and all of you to be all in. And it's only from that foundation that we're able to pursue our second objective, our all-in plan for Greater Cleveland to become once again one of the great regions in the Great Lakes. Now our planning process began, as most planning processes do, with a clear-eyed assessment of the situation. We benchmarked Greater Cleveland's performance across a range of important economic indicators, business growth, jobs growth, income growth, and we compared ourselves to a peer set of Midwest metro regions. Over the last decade, Greater Cleveland has been at best in the middle of that pack. We ranked eighth in jobs growth, eighth in business growth, and fifth in income growth compared to our peer set. Looking at many other indicators, whether it was productivity and innovation, educational attainment, minority-majority wage ratios, and population growth, same findings. But we also then took a look at our assets. And if you look at our assets across this region, we have many, many strengths. We have notable gaps, but most importantly, we have significant opportunities. And we recognize that we can and must do better. So over this period of time, working with the board, the team, and many of our partners, we've developed a vision and plans with benchmarks and goals 
and we've set an aspiration to once again become one of the great regions of the Great Lakes by 2030. To be to among the top tier of the Midwest regions in business growth, jobs growth, and income growth. Now to achieve that aspiration, the all-in plan has five priorities. All interlinked, all essential for moving the region forward. The first is dynamic businesses. Great regions are powered by dynamic businesses, businesses that are thriving and growing by innovating in their products, services, and operations. Our focus is on boosting productivity and innovation through technology for businesses, expanding their connections to research institutions, and fostering broader innovation investment. An example of this work are the strategies being pursued today to promote smart manufacturing, one of the critical growth sectors for the region's economy. The strategies have been summarized in the document called The Blueprint by Magnet, one of our partners. Examples of that strategy in action include new institutes at Case Western and Cleveland State, the opening of new corporate innovation centers at places such as Swagelock, Sherwin-Williams, and the new Ernst & Young Nottingham Spurks Global Innovation Hub in the Haltech Corridor. Recently, the U.S. Department of Commerce announced a national competition called their Build Back Better Challenge where up to $75 million could be won by a region that boot, uh, for an initiative that boosts both innovation but inclusive economic development. They shared that success would require not only a compelling strategy and a proposal, but success would require a demonstration that the region's private sector, nonprofit sector, and public sector stood united in their support for a region's proposal. When that competition was announced, we quickly gathered as a civic system, and together we determined that smart manufacturing was our strongest opportunity to win this competition. And that Magnet should lead the effort with support from many of its partners. So working with Magnet, a grant application was developed with supporting letters from over 150 organizations throughout the greater Cleveland area. Manufacturing companies, every chamber of commerce, Every foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, Jumpstart, Team Neo, Fund for Economic Future, the urban leagues throughout our region, the Hispanic Business Chambers, Case Western, Cleveland State, Tri-C, and every single county in the region, over 150 letters of support went in to demonstrate that as a region, we were unified. The result, our application from the greater Cleveland area was one of only 50 selected out of more than 600 to advance to the next round. That's all in. The prioritizing dynamic business is, al is also about scaling our research institutions. Two weeks ago at this Friday forum, we heard from NASA Glenn Director Marla Perez Davis. NASA Glenn is a treasured resource. Everyone, everyone dreams about space. But NASA Glenn is also a major asset in this region. And we believe NASA Glenn can be even more for this region. So working with our federal delegation, state and local officials, Jobs Ohio, the Ohio Aerospace Institute, and many members of our business community, we've initiated an advocacy strategy for expanding NASA Glenn's role and leadership in critical areas such as electric aircraft propulsion, communication services, and hypersonic testing, all of which have space but also commercial applications, and all of which could lead to greater economic development around NASA Glenn and throughout our region. That's all in for dynamic businesses. Now, of course, for dynamic businesses and research institutions to grow, they need talent. And thus, our second priority is all about abundant talent. Talent at every skill and experience level. This is not just an acute issue in this region due to the constrained labor supply. This is a long-term challenge for our region to truly thrive. Today, according to our partners at Team NEO, 47% of our graduates from higher education institutions remain in the region upon graduation. The benchmark across the Midwest is 55%. That change result would result in thousands of additional individuals each year staying, helping power those dynamic businesses and continue to grow in Greater Cleveland. Our focus in this strategy is significantly expanding the connection between dynamic businesses, especially in in-demand sectors, and the educational and workforce systems, encouraging and supporting businesses to significantly increase internships, co-ops, 
and apprenticeships so that students get practical learning and employers get access to emerging talent. And as students complete degree programs or certificate programs, they also come out with a job offer that makes them much more likely to stay at Greater Cleveland upon graduation. So one example of expanding this connections is Eaton, who has been working with many others on our IT sector partnership. Eaton recently shared that they've identified through that work not only new talent pipelines and programs that have enabled them to meet their hiring goals, but they've also exceeded their diversity goals for tech talent because of the work of the IT sector partnership. These sector partnerships were launched by the county and PACE, a similar program launched by CMSD, brings together employers, financial companies, banks, IT firms, healthcare organizations, manufacturers, and the workforce and educational system throughout our community. Together, over 100 companies are working with workforce education organizations, educational institutions, and nonprofits today collaborating and launching new initiatives such as Ohio to Work for Manufacturing Employment, Apprenti, a new tech apprenticeship program, and many more. Again, that's an example of what it means to be all in for abundant talent. But for us to have truly abundant talent, we must have our third priority, which is inclusive opportunity. Our region's workforce, our executives, our boards, and our business owners need to reflect our region's demographics. 50% of our region are women, 20% is black, 6% is Hispanic, and 7% is foreign born. To have dynamic businesses and abundant talent, we need to ensure individuals of all backgrounds participate in this region's growth and prosperity. Our focus here is on scaling more job creating and wealth creating minority based enterprises, increasing diverse talent development and hiring by reducing barriers, and continuing our efforts to ensure every resident is digitally connected for learning, earning, and living. Now those of you that know me know that I'm a huge sports fan. And right now the Cleveland Cavaliers are not only preparing to host the world here for the NBA All-Star Weekend, but they're also emerging as one of the best teams in the league. I love the Cavaliers not only for their team and what they do on the court, but I love them for what they do as an organization and their dedication to community and to inclusion. The Cavaliers are a part of Commit CLE, a program in which 22 large companies in our region, and more our count, more growing, are committed to supplier diversity, creating more opportunities throughout our community for minority-owned businesses. Connecting that commitment to our new Minority Business Center enables minority businesses we support to access customer opportunities and also access advice and support from a network of business service firms and organizations that can assist in their growth. Similarly, the Cleveland Guardians, our baseball team, tapped one of those centers' businesses recently to support their plan to exceed all of their inclusion and diversity targets for their upcoming ballpark renovations and operations. That's all in for inclusive opportunity. Now, dynamic businesses and talented individuals have the advantage that they can live anywhere, especially in a technologically interconnected world. So thus, our fourth priority is about ensuring that we have an appealing community. We must continually focus on improving our community and our amenities, especially with an eye to what future generations are looking for in places to live. And that's a bit about that as physical development. The opening video presented a future view of our city with many of the announced projects in place, a downtown reconnected to its waterfronts, and accessible and inclusive green spaces and public plazas throughout a completed public square with the Sherwin-Williams headquarters, a renewed baseball stadium, neighboring developments, all connected in an updated vision for how downtown, which is our friends at the Downtown Cleveland Alliance say, is both the front door and the living room for our region. But an appealing community is more than just a vibrant downtown. It's also about thriving neighborhoods, innovation corridors, and recreational amenities. It's looking at our community through the eyes of the next generation and recognizing the importance of our parks and trails, our world-class arts and culture community, and our restaurants and entertainment. And while we're blessed with what we already have here, and we must preserve that, we also have to recognize what we are missing and build more of it. More bike trails, more waterfront access, more diverse arts and cultural organizations, and more live music 
every night of this week of the week. Our work here involves being included as a convener, a catalyst and a coordinator, aligning public and private resources, participating in real estate financing through our real estate group, the Cleveland Development Advisors, and serving as an advocate for these initiatives. And we do this again in partnership, in close partnership with the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, our many public agency partners, federal partners, the private sectors, and many nonprofits. That's all in for an appealing community. Those four priorities are critical, but for accelerated and sustained success, we have a fifth priority that is equally critical and an accelerant to each of those four, and that's confidence. Confidence in the region is our fifth priority. We must have our leaders, private, public, and nonprofit, be ambassadors for our region. As a community, we lack collective confidence that Greater Cleveland is a great place to build businesses and build careers. When you ask Clevelanders about business success, too often in this community, people look backwards. They bring up old firms, TRW, BP. They talk about Rockefeller, M.A. Hanna, and so on. And when we dwell in our past, we miss seeing the present, and we miss seeing our future. As Greater Cleveland's history provides us a legacy, not just in companies, institutions, and philanthropy, but a legacy of traits embedded in this region's DNA. Traits such as enterprise, ambition, and innovation that are once again being expressed in powering our region today. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to play one of my favorite parlor games. And this is Do You Know? The question here is, do you know about this company? Just raise your hand if you are aware of this company. Overdrive. Okay, many hands have gone up. Overdrive, great company. Tech company, over 400 employees, 75 more being added, $400 million in revenues. Let's try again. Park Place Technologies. Okay, fewer hands. Park Place Technologies, another company that started in the 1990s, over 2,200 employees today, 150 countries that they're selling in. MRI software. Fewer hands. Over 2,700 employees globally, nearly 600 here in Seoul, and headquartered one of the real estate software leaders in the world. SPR Therapeutics. Many fewer hands. Spin out at a Case Western. Led by Maria Bennett, closed another nearly $40 million in financing last year to bring her product to market. How about within three? Okay, even fewer. Within three, a health IT services firm raised $100 million in their last financing round, led by Lance Hill, wonderful entrepreneur who happens to also be black. Satera. Okay. Satera, healthcare innovator company, led by Michael Peters. In the midst of this pandemic in November 2020, Satera went public. Its market capitalization today, $6 billion, sitting down the road. Peak Nanosystems, very few hands. $25 million raised just in the last three months. It's got leading edge technology for optical lenses and, and capacitors. How about Splash Financial? Okay, Splash Financial, building here. If you've heard of a company called SoFi that does student lending, Splash Financial does exactly that for graduate student lending, raised $45 million last year and is growing. And it's more than just tech businesses. It's cross-country mortgage, union home mortgage, rocket mortgage, all of which have announced expansions. It's progressive. Progressive, not only the level 20 group located here in downtown that's got 60 people and growing, but it's the fact that Progressive last year announced that they're hiring 6,400 people. 6,400 people. And it's Cleveland Cliffs more than $20 billion in revenue and growing, and so many more. My question to you is if you haven't heard of these companies and their successes, knowing more about them, has that changed your perception of Greater Cleveland as a great place to do businesses? Because that's just a glimpse. It's a glimpse of what's happening around us. There are many, many other businesses that are thriving and innovating here in Greater Cleveland in the 21st century. We have to recognize and celebrate these 21st century businesses and leaders, and through that recognition and celebration, build our confidence, confidence that is anchored on these thriving enterprises, confidence that we can convey, because projecting that confidence is gonna embolden others. It's gonna attract investment, attract talent, attract businesses, all of which accelerates our vision. To realize that vision, though, requires our third objective, 
renewing our focus on execution and outcomes. As the saying goes, vision without execution is just hallucination. For each of these priorities that we've outlined, we have targeted initiatives with plans, partnerships, and goals. Goals not only for 2030, but goals with annual milestones and metrics to track progress because we need to do this with urgency. We cannot miss this moment. It's not just about the leadership transition. We cannot miss this moment where we have an unprecedented time where market demand across every single sector is growing and private and public funding is flowing. In this moment, we can dramatically transform and advance our region. Some of the examples shared today are just earlier or glimpses of moving these strategies and priorities into action through partnerships and with urgency. Transforming this region requires translating the all-in mindset, spirit, and values into all-in execution towards community outcomes. What I've shared with you today is the vision, work, and commitment of our board, our members, our team, and many additional partners in the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. Hundreds of individuals that today are working together. We recognize that success requires those sectors, our civic system as we call it, to be connected and committed, collaborating and coordinating towards this common vision. More important than sectors and organizations, though, it's about individuals. It's about individual agency, individual ownership, individual trust, and individual partnerships towards an even greater Cleveland. Let me close by reminding you that we have done this before. We have navigated this pandemic, we've renewed our city, we've created broader opportunity, hosted global events, and yes, Cleveland, we have even won championships. And we are doing it again. We are doing this together, all in towards a great region on a great lake. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from every, everyone, City Club members, guests, students, all of you joining us via our live stream or the radio broadcast on 90.3 Idea Stream Public Media. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. You can also text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794, and our staff will do their best to work them into the program. May we have the first question, please. In the, in the uh, House Committee, the State and Local Government Committee, which would restrict uh, education in the classroom by not allowing teachers to teach about race and sexism and so forth. A number of businesses in the state have come out against those bills because we recognize that if students aren't able to discuss these things in their classroom, then it really takes away, to mention the word that you mentioned, it takes away their confidence to be able to uh, be citizens who advocate for a better society. So my question to you is, has the Greater Cleveland Partnership taken a stand on these two bills? And if not, why not? Sure. So we are monitoring uh, both of those bills that you've uh, referenced, and we recognize that in an election year, many times legislation gets introduced that is not really gonna have a chance of being advanced. We recognize that legislation is often introduced to send signals, in particular in primary elections. What we're focusing in on with the state of Ohio as it relates to education is really focusing on ensuring that the students that are coming through our higher ed or our high school systems as well as our higher ed systems have access to career exposure, career internships, so that we ensure that they are participating in pathways that get them to success upon graduation. Good afternoon, Mr. Shaw. I appreciate your comments, uh, your vision for Cleveland for the future. I think it's insightful. Uh, one of the questions and concerns that I do have, however, is being one of the oldest demographic areas in the country, how are we going to meld together some of these outlooks and opportunities so that people can actually, be, it can actually become tangible for the broader community? So a lot of conversations have been had about what can happen for those up and coming and for those that are yet to get here but how are we going to work with those that exist 
and uh, those that pretty much because they don't have the resources are where they are. Yeah, so there's a couple, a couple of parts to that question. I think the first part was, you know, how do we convince uh, a, a region with an older demographic to really uh, pay attention to what's important for the younger demographics? It's, am I understanding the question correctly? Exactly, okay. So I think from my perspective on that, it's demonstrating this with data. We can easily show them through comparisons with other geographies what the trajectory of communities look like when you invest in those things that matter to the next two generations versus communities that have chosen not to make those investments. Those examples will persuade the older demographics along with collective will. Again, this is not GCP alone, it's GCP with all of our partners, both inside of our organization, our private sector, but also our public and nonprofit partners, pushing that vision, that agenda. I think that's how we overcome the demographic divide and we recognize for the demographically, the older part of our demog demographic population, that there is benefit to them for having a more vibrant region as well. Yeah. Good afternoon, thank you for those, um, for those um, <clears throat> really strong remarks. Um, makes it an exciting time to be here in Cleveland. Um, you just spoke about the next couple generations um, I'm, I'm going to bring up the, the climate change issue, which is, mm -hmm. which, is the, which is probably the most important for the next several generations. Um, we just heard from John Mittenhauser a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago um, at, the, at, at a city club forum talking about how Ohio as a state, if it were an independent country, would be the 26th larger greenhouse emitter um, in the world. Um, what can GCP do as the largest metropolitan um, chamber of commerce in um, encouraging uh, further decarbonization in the manufacturing sector. Yeah, so there's a couple parts to that. So there's a lot that's happening at the federal level that's encouraging and incentivizing the decarbonization of not only manufacturing but other industries, and we wanna make sure that our region participates. So as one example within the, the Build Back Better grant, there are initiatives within there that are really more focused on uh, sustainability-oriented manufacturing as a part of the technology that we wanna make sure we nurture within this region. Another big part of that is encouraging our businesses to uh, support them in, sorry, in making that migration. So for many of our largest companies, especially those that are publicly traded, the pressure is on from investors globally about environmental sustainability and governance measures. What we try to do as an organization is support those companies in identifying resources locally that can be used to help support them in making their journey towards a more green uh, you know, operating enterprise, whether it's through renewable energy or renewable materials use in different types of production. The, the catchment basin for talent is the world. And it's no surprise that we're hearing the word global, the word international in much of what you say. My impression is that Cleveland is doing a good job of welcoming people from every place. Uh, and indeed, especially our healthcare institutions have many people from other countries. Uh, do you feel this is one of our strengths or is there more you'd like to see us do to make sure uh, our welcome mat is out? Thanks, Rick. So as you may know, I'm the founder and founding chairman of Global Cleveland tables here and our current chairman David Fleshler is here as well. So this is near and dear to my heart. We have to do a better job as Greater Cleveland of welcoming newcomers of all types into our region. We're not nearly doing enough. One great example is we have international students at all of our institutions of higher education. We still have barriers among many of our companies in considering these international students for internships or employment upon their graduation. And that's a missed opportunity. It, it's that leakage that we talked about that Team Neo has measured. We need to do a much better job of helping local employers understand not only the benefits, but the easy pathways by which they can employ international individuals that have arrived to Cleveland already, our temporary residents. At the same time, I think we need to do a much better job of welcoming international newcomers that are coming, that are not coming for higher education. And I think there, the work of Global Cleveland, led by Joe Simperman, is setting the stage, but more can be done. Also, 
compared to Dutch Mint, is Cleveland Airport is Cleveland's airport and limited direct flights to bring new big corporate projects to the region. What will the partnership do to advance advance proposed improvements? Great question. So there's there's a couple things as it relates to Cleveland's airport. The question was all about where, where are we in terms of number of direct flights? So this is exactly one of our strategies about expanding air services, and we've got a specific target of what we are looking to do. At our peak in 2019, we had 147 daily nonstops from Greater Cleveland. In 2021, that had restored, it would drop down to as low as the mid-50s in the midst of the pandemic, it went back to 98. And this year, our aim is to get that back up to 125, to sort of get it to almost 90% of where, where it was. Having direct nonstops throughout the country, domestic nonstops, especially to gateway airports in this country, is a critical issue. And it is an issue that you know, will fluctuate based on market demand. It's something that we will certainly support as the Greater Cleveland Partnership. An example of that was the partnership we uh, had with Team Neo, Jobs Ohio, Destination Cleveland, the county, and the city last year to bring Alaska Airlines as a new carrier to Cleveland Hopkins and to establish direct daily service to Seattle starting this summer. So we're gonna to continue to push on air services because it is critical for businesses, but we also wanna see airport improvements, improvements that really address the, uh, the passenger experience at the airport to enhance that so that as visitors arrive to Cleveland or as all of us you know, uh, transit from Cleveland, that we're getting a world-class experience going through our airport and so that's an important ambition for us as well. Afternoon, Deju. Chris. Um, you reference that uh, we need to be all in to take advantage of this opportunity that's in front of us. Being all in requires the all to trust each other. And uh, I was just curious if you would share some examples of how you and GCP have worked in the nine months that you've been at the helm to build more trust with different players in different sectors here in Greater Cleveland. Sure. So, you know, the trust is built through the, the work. It's not enough to say these words. And so all of the examples, you know, whether it's around the Build Back Better grant and smart manufacturing, or it's the sector partnerships, or it's Commit CLE in the Minority Business Center, or the work we're doing in physical development with the city of Cleveland and many partners, it's reestablishing that trust through the actual work project by project and living the values that we espouse. There's no other way to, to get there other than to continue to demonstrate and to demonstrate as GCP that sometimes we'll lead, but sometimes we're happy to be supporters and other times we'll just be cheerleaders. We don't have to be in the leadership role. It's not about, again, who's in the lead, who supports, or most importantly, it's not about who gets credit. It's about getting the work done. Is there an opportunity for Cleveland to benefit from the new semiconductor factory that is being built in um, around Columbus, and what is the Greater Cleveland, Cleveland Partnership doing in connection with that? Yeah, we're very excited about Intel's big announcement to establish this new, or two new fabs down in the Greater Columbus area. A number of Intel suppliers are already located throughout Northeast Ohio. So for those companies, this is gonna be a huge win and huge lift. We're also connecting companies that are interested into Intel's information chain, so far it's information. Remember the plant won't open for another four years. And we're also approaching Intel to ask them about, in the meantime, while we're doing construction, are there opportunities for some of our construction related firms to potentially bid for to be a part of these projects as well. So there is a huge opportunity for our greater Cleveland companies to participate it because of the proximity that we have, as well as the expertise in smart manufacturing that many of our companies already have in the supply chain for Intel. Good afternoon, Beiju, and thank you so much for your remarks today. Sure. Um, I wanna ask you about something that's actually in the all-in uh, plan as I was reading it. On page 12, you specifically call out uh, advocating for funding for multimodal transit, and you also mentioned how we would like to see economic development align with existing assets like public transportation. Yep. As a follow-up to that question, uh, one of the um, byproducts of the infrastructure bill was expansion of Amtrak across the country. Yep. And I'm wondering if the Greater Cleveland Partnership has supported or will support expansion of Amtrak here in the state of Ohio. So one of the exciting visions that we've seen for Amtrak in the, uh, in the state of Ohio is plans that Amtrak has to better connect 
not only throughout the state, but connecting east-west, you know, through the Detroit, uh, to the Detroit airport, as well as, you know, over to Chicago, as well as to, uh, down to Pittsburgh. So we're excited about what Amtrak has got proposed, and we're excited about sort of the idea of more fre frequent service, in particular to those markets where, you know, we can access uh, the international airport that uh, Detroit has and the flights that they have out in that direction. A lot remains to be seen in terms of how that money is actually going to flow from Washington as it relates to Amtrak and also what it means for state or station renovations here in downtown Cleveland for Amtrak's current uh, location uh, on, on the north coast here. We have a, another Twitter question. Gerrymanders and state house, state house bills that undermine voting rights are bad for democracy, good for corruption, and bad for business. Will GCP take a strong stand now to stand up stand up for fair districts and against voter suppression bills? You know, we, uh, we're supportive of the constitutional amendment that went through that created a new process and a new standard by which districts, both at the uh, state house level as well as the congressional level, have to be drawn by the state legislature. So we recognize that there's a political process that's going on right now among the legislatures to define new maps, and we're waiting to see where the legislators the Supreme Court of Ohio, as well as the redistricting commission come out on all of that. Beja, there's another question from Twitter here um, about the fight for 15. After that fight for 15 campaign, uh, GCP successfully lobbied state legislature to preempt local policy attempts to improve job quality. With renewed commitment on abundant talent inclusion and income growth, will GCP be working to repeal this legislation? You know, right now our focus um, honestly is around finding workers. Uh, you know, it would be $15 an hour is no longer a, uh, it's not even a standard. Everyone's offering much, much more than that for trying to find individuals to show up for any type of work that's there, whether it's service firms or production firms. I don't know enough about the specific legislation as it predates me in terms of local control versus state control, but we want to make sure that our businesses in the greater Cleveland area and particularly in localities in Greater Cleveland, are not at a competitive disadvantage relative to other regions around the state. There's a, another question that came via text, and I'll just mention the number for our radio audience if they want to text a question to 330-541-5794. Um, how will new leadership at City Hall and in county government enhance the partnership's ability to promote and improve the region's economic assets? So we can speak about new leadership at City Hall in particular since that transition has already occurred. And I would say that with the new mayor and his team, there's a very tight uh, and very productive partnership across a range of these issues. Uh, we are working in close concert with the chief and the director that are here with us today, as well as many other members of the administration on a number of the priorities that we've outlined in the all-in plan. We have another text question. Cleveland is the nation's poorest big city and 25% of us don't have access to a car. On top of that, less than one third of Northeast Ohio jobs are transit, transit accessible. We've lost 30% of service in just 15 years. This isn't a micro problem and won't be solved with micro transit pilot programs. Right, so there's, there's a couple elements of transit that we are strongly for. Transit oriented development first and foremost. We would love to see more development occur where jobs are accessible to individuals based on transit service that's already existing, whether that's train or bus. And we've been big advocates at the State House in ensuring that we have strong transit funding in the most recent transportation bill as well as on an ongoing basis. That's one of the uh, solutions. And then the second is the microtransits to support in particular areas that are disconnected from existing transit routes. So how we create more creative transit uh, connections with RTA and other public transit partners is something we would certainly be open to, uh, to supporting. Bijou, is GCP satisfied with the process by which replacement or rebuilding of the Justice Center is being pursued? And what changes would you like to see in that process before we spend a billion dollars? So. That is, uh, that's an area that we have not been involved as it relates to the, the Justice Center renovation at this point. So we, I would have to just 
uh, say, I'll get back to you on that. We have not yet been asked for an opinion on anything related to the Justice Center proposals. Hi, Bijou. You mentioned uh, the survey set of Midwest towns, a uh, little bigger, a little smaller in Cleveland, and said so we're in the middle. You talked about fifth, eighth. Number one, curious what yep. the, the number was. And then the second part of that, from uh, areas near and dear to your heart and all our hearts, especially Eds and Meds, where do we rank? Yeah, so, you know, so we looked at the 11 major metro areas in the Midwest not including Chicago. Chicago was sort of differently situated than the other 11. And I think your question is where, where do we rank? Or was that the, or? It's 11, 11 total metro areas across uh, the, the Midwest that we looked at. And the 11 that you would expect, and I think you can see them on our website as well in terms of what those 11 are. But we ranked again, eighth out of 11 on uh, business growth, eighth in jobs growth, fifth in income growth over the last decade. And then we looked at a whole host of other measures as well. As it relates to eds and meds, you know, we have an amazing array of higher education, not only institutions, but students and uh, uh, degree graduates each year. Uh, we don't have a singular flagship institution the way that a Columbus would. We have many, many others. But if you add the collection of all of those institutions together and the talent that that produces, that's an enormous resource for our region that, again, we are underutilizing in terms of retaining them upon uh, their graduation. So that is an opportunity for us, for sure. And then in the med sector, you know, make no mistake that Cleveland is recognized as one of the leading places, not just in the Midwest, but in the world in healthcare. It's the reason why people travel from around the country, around the world to come for their clinical care, it's because of the quality of the healthcare professionals and the healthcare innovators that we have in our midst. And that is a huge strength that stands out and on one which we are gonna to continue to build as a region. We have another text question. Does the partnership support the proposal to spend millions of dollars more to upgrade the unused former, me former medical mark to make it part of the convention center or does it f favor finding another use? You know, with all these questions, I should feel, feel like Marty McGann should be up here <laughs> instead, of, instead of me. So I'm just going to keep looking at Marty and he'll tell me when I'm saying the wrong thing. But uh, in particular for the, you know, the, the renovation of the Global Center, what I would say is that we, up, we appreciate and we've heard certainly from Destination Cleveland, one of our partners, that there is a shortage of meeting space. And that shortage of meeting space constrains our ability to compete for different types of glo um, meetings and conventions. The specific proposal, the $46 million or so to both put in the escalators, put in more meeting rooms, expand the ballrooms, we haven't seen the detail on that specific proposal, but the general concept is something we would support and we would wanna see more analysis to be done about whether that proposal is the right proposal and also how does that renovation uh, connect to city assets such as public hall and what are we doing to make sure that the public hall asset is connected better into the convention center, as well as some of our hotel assets, such as the Marriott across the street. So we'd want to understand that proposal in more detail. Yeah, thank you. It seems to me that the American Recovery uh, Act uh, is presenting us with a great opportunity that might have a short window. As I understand it, there's what, 510 million to the city and another 240 or 50 to the to the county, yeah. what role uh, does your organization play, if any, yeah. in the uh, recommendation for the allocation of that money? So the city, uh, the prior city administration under Mayor Jackson asked the Greater Cleveland Partnership to work with the city administration to convene a series of uh, partners to explore opportunities to leverage those dollars, those one-time dollars, as you noted. So we convened nine of our banking partners, many of whom are here today, as well as uh, foundations throughout our community, as well as a couple of financial funds to explore opportunities to create new products and tools that would not only invest in the city's goals, and this is the city's leadership, it's the city's determination. Their goals were around neighborhood development and around small business, but that would leverage their dollars, the public dollars with private or philanthropic dollars on top of that. Those proposals, uh, continue to be out there. They were not uh, pursued any further just given the transition, but it is a conversation we will continue certainly with the new administration of the city. 
Similarly, we have been talking to the county about the dollars that they have and ideas that we could see on how those dollars could be amplified through public-private partnerships. The county's proposals, I think, will be forthcoming from both county council as well as the county executive in, in short order. Good afternoon. Um, I want a quick question about um, the Cleveland Innovation Project, something I participated in a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, there were all these industry clusters, and yep. one that kind of evolved from it was water innovation, yeah. something that hadn't really been, you know, a, a, a flag that we've planted in the community, even though we sit on this glorious Great Lake. So curious is how that is evolving, how the work of the Cleveland Water Alliance yep. is being more integrated into yep. the work of the GCP. What are some of the advocacy potentials, and how can we really make water an actual industry standard for our community like Eds and Meds and others? Thank you for asking that question. So by pure coincidence, and you had no idea of this, but we just had our Cleveland Innovation Project Steering Committee earlier today where we reported out to the Steering Committee our 2021 results against targets that were set and our new 2022 targets. And we'll be sharing that more publicly shortly as well. Water tech was one of the three sectors identified as a part of the Cleveland Innovation Project. And for those of you that are not familiar with that effort, that was an effort that was really started by the partnership, Jumpstart, Team Neo, the Cleveland Foundation, and the Fund for Economic Future as an effort to bring together a cohesive regional strategy to focus on the innovation and tech sectors and how do we sort of position Greater Cleveland once again to be among the leaders in the Midwest. Three sectors emerged, two that were obvious, smart manufacturing and healthcare. We've talked about our strengths in those areas. The one that was the surprise throughout this entire process is we looked at all the other technology sectors that we could consider as areas that could be distinctive uh, and where we could have you know, unique access and that actually met a market need was water. And it's water not because of just that wonderful natural resource to the north of Lake Erie, but it was water because we have a range of companies throughout Greater Cleveland, companies such as Moen and Odie and many others, Connecticut, that are experts in managing the flow of water monitoring the quality of water, treating and remediating water. All of those companies, their products are in huge demand because of the water stresses, not in our region, but the water stresses throughout the rest of the country and throughout the rest of the world. So that effort is still very much alive well. The Cleveland Water Alliance has been the spearhead on that, much like Magnet on manufacturing, and we've been building water test beds. We've rec been recognized again by the Department of Commerce with Blue Economy Grants, and these test beds are attracting firms from around the world to test their products and then also to explore commercial partnerships and operations here in the greater Cleveland area. So that's a huge opportunity for us from a business perspective is the water tech sector. Correlated to that, though, is also water as a natural resource. Right? And water is a natural resource not only for the types of companies that are water intensive in their use and sort of the ability for us to have access to clean water and uh, surplus water is still unique and it's an asset that we want to attract businesses around. But it's also water as a recreational uh, asset for us. So those are important parts of the vision as we, as we go forward. There's a final question um, that came via text and, and it's gotta be a quick one, um, unfortunately. But the uh, recent research has suggested that uh, Cleveland is one of the worst cities in the nation for black women. Um, what is the GCP going to do to address this issue and turn the city into a place where black women can more easily start successful businesses and thrive? Great. So our focus, again, is on inclusive opportunity for people of all backgrounds. And so it's about ensuring that individuals who, whether they are black women or others, you know, have access to the ability to participate in growing sectors, whether that's as talent or as business owners and giving them the support that they need and also reducing the barriers to hiring and reducing the barriers to training that may exist and providing the wraparound supports to ensure that individuals can access the training and development programs that are there, in addition to supporting their businesses if they are entrepreneurs. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum featuring Beiju Shaw, President and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. It is part of our Local Heroes series in partnership with Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy. We would like to also welcome guests at tables hosted by Cuyahoga County Community College, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Global Cleveland, 
Jumpstart, Greater Cleveland Partnership, and PNC Bank. We're happy to have all of you here. We have two great forums at the City Club next week. On Thursday, February 17th, we will hear from Council President Blaine Griffin and Felton Thomas, Executive Director and CEO of the Cleveland Public Library as part of the Library Founders Day Forum. And on Friday, February 18th, we will celebrate the start of NBA All-Star Week here in Cleveland. We will welcome two-time NBA All-Star and former Cleveland ba Cavalier, Baron Davis. He will be in conversation with Mayor Justin Bibb, talking about leadership, entrepreneurship, and black excellence. You can purchase tickets and learn more about other forums at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Beiju Shaw, and thank you, members and friends of the City Club. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.